I'm Dr. Ayana Conway, and it is indeed a pleasure to welcome you to our HBCU Up Broadening Participation of Minority Females in STEM Fall Luncheon. And I thank everyone who helped make this day happen. This event, the first of two, is sponsored by the National Science Foundation, grant number 1717082. <laughs> the spring STEM luncheons is scheduled for Friday, February 1st at noon, right here in Gateway. So mark your calendars now for Friday, February 1st to attend the second luncheon. The spring luncheon, like today's event, will be videotaped for future broadcast. It's my privilege to introduce our keynote speaker and colleague, Akinyela Kab Abdullah, PhD, serves as an associate professor of ecology and environmental science and is the co-PI and director of the Community Cultural Research Scholarship at Virginia Union University in Richmond. Dr. Cobb Abdullah earned her doctorate degree in philosophy and environmental science from Florida A&M University. She earned her master's degree in molecular biology from Florida A&M University as well, and her Bachelor of Science degree in biology from Tuskegee University. As a product of historically black universities, Dr. Cobb Abdullah is very passionate about giving back through mentoring of students. She has served as a research mentor to several undergraduate and high school students. Dr. Cobb Abdullah is very committed to community outreach, striving to increase STEM exposure for students in underserved communities. Since moving to Virginia, Dr. Cobb Abdullah has conducted STEAM workshops here at VSU, participated in the VSU Garden Warriors program, helped to mentor elementary school students at the VSU Harding Street Ag Center and the Petersburg Library. Dr. Cobb Abdullah has also served as a collaborator with VSU SGA to host a 2017 STEM day here at VSU for elementary school students. She also participated in the PBS Idea Station annual PBS Explore the Outdoors event in Richmond. This summer, Dr. Cobb Abdullah served as a research mentor at the Virginia Union University Summer Research Program, researching the impact of metals and air pollution on the quality of urban agricultural products. Dr. Cobb Abdullah is the wife of Dr. Makola Abdullah and mother of two children, Seifietu and Mikaili. Let's give a warm Trojan welcome to Dr. Cobb Abdullah. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I am extremely excited to be here uh, to share this time with you all. Um, I am very passionate about STEM. I, it's going to be what I do for the rest of my life, and anytime I have an opportunity to share what my journey has been with uh, young people to help them on their journey, I will jump at the chance. So um, thank you all for your attention, and uh, I, I will try very hard to be as lively as possible. Um, this was an opportunity uh, at the YMCA. There were people who came to donate book bags and school supplies and 
do get do young ladies hair uh, at the beginning of the school year and cut the little guys hair too so that they could go back to school prepared I thought that was really cool and there was a big presence as you can see uh, Virginia State University there so um, I'm looking forward to working with them again next year I actually didn't really do much there I just kind of like came out to check out the scene and ran into all these wonderful people and the other thing I want to see is some of those young ladies in the pictures I found out are, are biology majors so I was expecting to see some of them here and maybe they'll come in a little bit later okay all right so of course I was given a list of uh, fantastic questions to address uh, for this talk and one of them was uh, about life work balance um, for young women in particular who are on this journey in STEM you might find that uh, it's going to take a lot of your time a lot of your brain power and balancing your social life with your academic life might seem to be kind of a challenge but you can do it with good time management skills um, these are the areas of my life that I focus on and have you know focused on since I started on the STEM path to help me uh, to be fortified and strong and be able to continue to thrive in my STEM area um, I am excited about my family and I know you probably are tired of hearing my husband and I brag on our children but we do that every chance we can get to um, we have a daughter and a son my son is the oldest however my daughter's temperament makes people think that she might be the oldest um, but my son is at Morehouse and he is graduating this December and my daughter is actually a Trojan and she will be finishing this December as well. I'm very, very proud of them. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, my daughter is majoring in mass comm. Uh, I couldn't convince her to, uh, to do a STEM path. I see she has a cheerleader over there for that area, okay. And my son, however, is majoring in biology. So I'm really excited about that. He is going to go on to do an MD, PhD. Um, he's looking right now for you know where he's going to do that. They both are graduating early, so they have a little cushion, and little cushion uh, time to get it all together. And my daughter is going to either enter into industry or she is going to go to graduate school. So again, I'm really extremely proud of them. I was thinking about what else I want to say about them in terms of the impact that they have had on me on my STEM journey. Um, being a mom. I, I'm sure there are parents in the room. When you have children, your children are like a mirror. Uh, they are going to show you all of your flaws. They are going to put a mirror up to you and show you your inconsistencies. As far as education is concerned, I did not want my children to see um, a feeble-minded, uh, inconsistent, undisciplined uh, person their mother going through her educational journey because I actually started my graduate program after I had them well I was pregnant with my son going through my master's program and then I had my daughter uh, later so um, <clears throat> I, I wanted them to know what hard work looked like I wanted I didn't want to be the kind of mom that says you know get in there and do your homework and you can't watch television and you can't do all of these other things that you might find fun until you do your work first and not reflect that myself um, so they got to see mom go through her uh, doctoral program and they got to see what hard work is like and I am so sure that it has had an impact on their outlook on education and what it takes to thrive uh, my son uh, around third grade he started to show a little, you know, he didn't seem as dedicated. I don't know what his dad told him. Um, so that was the first thing that kind of set him straight. I don't know what my husband told him, but he started to do a little bit better. And I'm sure watching me uh, and my work ethic, I'm sure that that had an impact on him. He has an incredible work ethic. This kid is studying during downtime when everybody else is trying to go and socialize and do, do stuff. He is like sitting there. It's kind of weird, <laughs> you know, how dedicated he is, but it has served him very, very well, and I'm very proud of him. 
Um, and then my daughter, she is just, she is exceptional, just naturally exceptional. I'm not just saying that because she's my child, but she is. She just, just mows down anything that she decides to set her mind to. So um, I can't take full credit for that. I think that that's uh, something from the creator that she has. And of course, she has a dad with a big brain, so you know, maybe that kind of helped a little bit too. So, um, but they keep me grounded. Uh, this lady right here is my mother-in-law, fabulous first Dr. Abdullah. She was, uh, she's a psychologist. She had her own practice. She, so she's an entrepreneur. She just is a go-getter. Uh, she doesn't take any excuses. And she mentored me uh, while she was around with us. She doesn't live in the States anymore, but when she was here, she would mentor me and keep me on track and say, you could do whatever it is you set your mind to. And, and she just wouldn't let up. So <laughs> I had to do, I had to do good things. So, um, and she was my husband's biggest cheerleader. So I take um, a note from her about how to be a supportive wife because she would listen to him. I could care less about a lot of whatever it is he's talking about that's going on at work. But she would sit there and listen to him and tease out, you know, how's everything going and who said what and what did, who did this and all of that. So I kind of watched her and learned how to do that from her. Um, I was just talking to Maya, Mia, Mia uh, about the fact that we lived in Tallahassee for uh, about 15 years before my husband started to move into other areas uh, of his, his work. And we were able to build community. We came at a time when there were a lot of young people that were around our age starting their families, and some of them were in graduate school, some of them were starting their professional lives, but we were all starting our, having our children. And one of my friends in particular, she really stepped up and made it so that I would be able to go to school because I have two small children and I'm not just gonna leave them anywhere and I can't take them to class with me because I am in the STEM field, so that could be dangerous. Um, so, but if it were not for her, I, I'm, she'll be my sister forever. She took care of my kids and she took care of everybody's kids too, so. And then later on, we were able to return the favor and she went back to school and got her MBA and uh, we were able to watch her children for her, so. Um, we all, I also, uh, we had a community dance class um, and this kind of ties into time for me. I would go to this African dance class. It was where all of my friends were, and it was time for me to relax and enjoy myself and be away from school. So um, I really, really am very grateful to those people. And I, every time I get back to Tallahassee, I make sure that I spend time with them. Um, as far as work is concerned, um, I enjoy my work. I've been working with students. I had to, uh, I, I had to TA. That was the way I paid for graduate school when I initially started, uh, outside of getting fellowships and scholarships. But um, I, I just love the students. They keep you fresh. Uh, in the beginning, you don't know anything. I was like a, maybe a year away from having graduated, and now I'm thrown into a class where I have to teach people. And I'm like, are you all serious? <laughs> You're going to give me this class? This is my class? They were like, sure, you can do it. Um, but the students were very, um, they kept me sharp, made me learn. When you get a bachelor's degree, the, 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 pa the pace at which you are moving, especially if you are not paying really close attention, you can miss a whole lot. You can pass a class, but if you didn't learn anything, <laughs> it's possible to actually do that, to actually pass the class. But if you can figure out how to learn something, it'll make passing the class way easier than all of the little tricks and things that students are trying to use now to finesse this grade. Uh, so just really just commit to the experience and, and really just try to learn something. Because I'm going to tell you, when they put me in that class, I had to learn that stuff. I didn't want to be teaching people misinformation. So I had to learn whatever the holes were in, in my bachelor's degree experience. I had to sit down now and I had to learn the information because I, it, it was my responsibility to pass the information on to the next group of people. So uh, you, there are no shortcuts. You might as well do it in the time that you have so that you can actually grow. I think about how I could have been so much further along and could have built so much more on what it is I needed to know had I committed to the, you know, to the experience at the time. You know, but you have to go back and get it. Uh, everybody has heard of Sankofa, go back and fetch it. You cannot build on a, a, a shoddy uh, foundation, so you have to go back and get it. So anyway, these, these people, my lovely family, 
in my community, in my work family, the students in particular, all of these areas of my life fortify me and have fortified me and enabled me to progress in my uh, STEM field. And I know that everybody is not blessed to have you know, family, but you can build community and your community can become your family. And you always want to surround yourself with people who are helping you to get to where it is you say you want to go. You set a goal and you be purposeful about that and you surround yourself with people who are going to help you get there, not people who are going to hold you back and stifle you and treat you like you're a bank or their personal social worker or psychologist. You are not in a position to help anybody just yet. So focus on yourself. It's okay to be selfish at this time about getting the knowledge that you need to proceed in STEM. Um, what I'm going to talk about next is the fact that there is still a need in this country for us to address issues as it relates to uh, people of color getting graduate degrees or getting uh, degrees, period. And then I'm also going to show you some data about the disparity that exists between women in this country and uh, getting degrees. So the first one will be about just people of color. So this data comes from National Science Foundation. And if you look at this, the red bar is real high in all categories. The red bar corresponds to white people or Caucasians. Um, there's been a lot, there's a lot going on right now in this country in terms of access and privilege. And one of the things that I would I have to speak to uh, is the fact that HBCUs are, cons some people are arguing that HBCUs are irrelevant. Uh, a lot of the reason why this graph looks like this is because people haven't had an opportunity. Uh, another issue associated with that is people don't have the opportunity because they can't afford it. People don't have the money. We have to do better. We really have to do better. We have to support HBCUs in particular because HBCUs are institutions of opportunity, especially for students of color, and have been historically. And we've never, HBCUs do not discriminate against anybody. Anybody can go to an HBCU. And you all have to say that you've seen anybody here. <laughs> anybody and everybody, you have seen them. And if you go to any HBCU, you will see anybody and everybody there. That's not the case for a lot of us at other institutions. So please don't get caught up in the conversation that this institution or these institutions are not relevant. They are extremely relevant and they will help us to make all of the other color bars <laughs> rise to the red bar. So we really need to do better. This is kind of sad because it's 2018 and we're getting ready to go into 2019. And even though this data this one is from 2012. I'm sure that there's not very much difference in the data for uh, this year and years between 2012 and 2018. So we need to do a whole lot better. This, this uh, data represents women. Um, we can see that women have been able to get bachelor's degrees where about, what, 50, 55%, but it's stagnant, not much movement. We need to do better. I'm going to highlight one of the uh, ladies who has taken it upon herself to use her education to expose young ladies to coding. You probably have heard of her. I'll wait till I get to the slide to talk about it. I think I saw some paperwork on the table about her already. So, um, But we need to, if you can get out and do any type of community service, if you are a STEM person, young person, professor, anybody, if you can contribute to bringing younger people along, exposing them to STEM areas and STEM activities, we can make, these, uh, we can make this graph look different. We need to include young women. Uh, we need to target young women so that we can bring them into STEM fields. Another reason why we need to do this is science is used, science and technology, science and engineering is used to make improvements in society. You have to have diversity in science. 
If you don't have diversity in science, then only problems that affect the majority are being addressed. If we're not at the table, we can't contribute, we can't make sure that our issues are being addressed. So how do we do that? One way is through education. One way is, another way is through exposure. Volunteer, become a member of a professional organization and get into your community and target small young children and introduce them. Because a lot of times people only go into fields of study that they've been exposed to. So if you've never seen a scientist, or maybe you have, but you didn't know they were a scientist. I'll be honest with you, I did not know my grandmother. She's not a STEM person, but I didn't know she had a master's degree in language until much later on. Because she's right under my nose, <laughs> you know? And I'm not, we're not engaging like that. We're engaging as granddaughter and grandmother. But if you're standing next to children at your church, if you're standing next to them, um, anywhere else, please target the young women in particular and help shepherd them into the STEM field so that we could change the outlook and increase diversity so that we can address issues that we have. And right now we have a lot of issues as women, not only in STEM, but socially. Okay, so I'm gonna take a, a point of privilege the, one of the other questions I was asked is, what are the leading experts doing in STEM? And I wanted to make sure that I highlighted uh, women of color and what they're doing in STEM. Uh, this young lady, Dr. Hadia Green, she is a physicist, and she has decided to use her knowledge of physics and lasers to address cancer research. She actually had an aunt how many people have ever heard of Hadia Green? Okay, she had an aunt who had cancer and died from it, and she has made it her life's work to address this, this issue because she loved her aunt and she didn't want anybody else to suffer through that. So um, if you are a biologist or a physicist or even a chemist uh, and you're interested in cancer research, or you know somebody, you know, you can follow her lead. She has a capital campaign, I think it's named for her aunt, I can't think of her name right now, but she's raising money. So like many of us will get out, we'll, we'll apply for grants from the National Science Foundation or maybe even other private in, uh, industry or companies. She was like, hey, I'm just gonna go ahead, see if I can raise this money, it's for a great cause, and that's what she's doing. The next lady is Kimberly Bryant. She is the lady who started Black Girls Code. And that's who I was mentioning earlier. I saw some flyers on the table. She is an engineer. She decided I'm going to target young girls. She said that she was working in industry and she kept hearing people say, I can't find any black people, any black women in particular who could code. And she was like, that's not, that can't be true. We have a lot of young women probably in CIS here. So why, why are people saying that? So she decided that she would start Black Girls Code, and I believe it's kind of like a franchise setup now. Like I know um, one of the uh, wonderful faculty, our math chair, we've been talking about possibly doing one of those Black Girl Code uh, franchises in this area. So, um, oh, there she is, <laughs> Dr. Cheryl Adeyemi. She is the chairwoman of the math department here at the Virginia State University. She is awesome. She is a PI on a couple of grants too. And uh, she was one of the first people to invite me to come and share my STEM knowledge with one of her uh, summer institute students. So we did something on uh, recycling, reuse, and reduce. It was fun. Um, then we have Dr. Trina Renze. She's a biomedical engineer and she, uh, applies her knowledge to doing stem cell research, which is it's a phenomenal area to go into as well. All right. We have Dr. Shanti Johnson. I just fell in love with her story because she's doing work that is more environmental. Um, she's doing work with uh, the oil spills, trying to figure out how to create technology to address oil spills, especially uh, after the BP oil spill. A lot of that uh, oil particulates and matter was widely distributed, and they're still trying to figure out how to get it out of the out of the water. Oh, look, another VSU faculty member, Dr. Leslie Whiteman. She is a biology professor here. You didn't know you were going to be featured, did you? I didn't know it was for a professor. Oh, 
<laughs> oh, sorry, uh, associate? Yes. Okay, she is an associate professor. I am learning that I have to be careful with that because I introduce myself to I'll say professor and my husband's like, no ma'am. <laughs> so, I am also an associate professor, right? So, correction, I got it. All right, but she works here in the Department of Biology. And uh, I first met Dr. Whiteman, um, I guess officially at the train station. We were on our way to the NSF uh, meeting in DC. But everybody where I work, oh my God, they talk about Dr. Whiteman. Dr. Whiteman is Dr. Whiteman that and are very, very sad. And I think I've adopted one of her really good friends. And every once in a while, I'll hear that too. Yes, when Leslie was here, <laughs> we used to go to lunch, and we used to do this and do that. She really misses you, so you might want to call her. <laughs> okay. All right. Oh, look, one more VSU professor. Did you all know all these fabulous people who are on your campus, these STEM professors? Of course you did, because you've taken their class, okay. Um, Dr. Corley is uh, the interim chair of the Department of Ag. And I personally have gotten to know her because my son comes here in the summer, my biology major son, he comes here in the summer and he does research with her. And he also has done research uh, with Dr. Adeyemi and has gone to conferences to present the work that he's done with, with both of those fabulous uh, professors. Um, I know she does work with sheep, sheep tissue. That's all I can remember, but it's still fascinating to me. Um, and then we have Dr. Aletha Maybank. She is a doctor, and she wants to teach people in the community about preventative care. You can control what you put in your mouth. That's one way you can help your health. I have a coworker, she walks the hall. She just walks, walks, walks. And she was like, yeah, I can't lose this weight. And I said, well, what do you eat? She said, well, I've got to have my chips and stuff. And I was like, well, ma'am, you can walk, 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 but if you don't eat, you're going to keep that weight on. And she told me a couple of weeks ago, I didn't buy the chips this week. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, good for you. And I think maybe she's going to see some progress soon. But um, this woman wants to be out in the community. She's out in the community teaching people how you can take control of your health and things that you can do so that you don't uh, amass. Uh, would you rather spend your money on preventative care or triple the mon amount of money you're going to spend on going into the healthcare system to address the symptoms, not address the root problem of your illness? So I'm like, so for what she's doing. So you might want to check that out. All right. All right, so I have some practical tips for STEM students. Uh, as you are going through your journey, it looks like a lot of words. Uh, <laughs> um, one of the things that I did not do as an undergraduate student, and I am still catching up on this right now, is I did not join a professional organization. Actually, I did. My teacher told me that I needed to subscribe to Science Magazine. So it is that uh, all American Association for Advancement of Science, a, a, a triple AAAS. I did join that so I could get the discounted rate for Science Magazine. So that is the one that I did. I think it was like $75 a year. That still may be cost, cost prohibitive for undergraduate students. Remember, I was married at the time, so I could afford $75 for the year. And I wish I could still pay $75 for the year now, but I can't because I'm not a student anymore. Um, but I did join that organization. But if you are uh, engineer, I know for a fact that there is a NASB chapter on this campus. So you don't even have to be an engineer. You can join NASB. They do a whole host of activities. And remember, I was encouraging you to um, reach out to smaller children. They do a lot of work with the youth to introduce them to uh, STEM areas and activities. So you could do that. Uh, American Association of Black and energy, energy is a really, really big deal in this country. We like our oil. We like our coal. We're fighting for uh, green technologies, and it's really a big fight. I just watched a documentary yesterday about the electric car. I did not know that that documentary existed. I did not know electric cars go way, way back. And so that really impressed upon me the idea that the oil industry is not going to move to the side very easily at all. Even when they have the last drop of oil, they'll still be fighting. So um, people who are in uh, uh, 
engineering who are interested in en energy, this might be an organization you might want to join. Uh, for biologists or chemistry majors, I mentioned AAAS, uh, American Chemical Society, and the American Society for Microbiologists. I am affiliated with American Chemical Society. That's usually for people who major in chemistry, but so I'm still going to participate. I actually did some community service targeting youth at the Science Museum. Uh, maybe last semester with them. And uh, we're taking some of our students to Pfizer, and I know there'll be uh, students from Virginia State also uh, for Women's Day at Pfizer. And the lady who hosts that, who's the head person there, is uh, American Chemical Society um, officer in the, in the organization. So that's how I got tied into to what they do. Um, don't join a whole lot of them. <laughs> you just join maybe one or two, and then just participate, OK? Because um, you don't want to add to what your your workload already, you know, your responsibilities that you already have. Anybody a member of any of these organizations in here already? Okay, that's great. So we want to make sure there are more hands that go up uh, in the future. And then physics. Um, there's a National Society of Black Physicists, and then there's a National Society for Women in Physics too. This is a website, I had to put this in here because I am not a writing teacher. However, the grammar that I see when you guys turn in your assignments, it just really makes, it just makes me cringe. Okay, that doesn't address grammar, but it does address plagiarism. I don't understand why students think that if I copy what I see in a resource and put it in my paper and that that's okay. That's actually stealing. That's stealing. And think about it if it was your words and your work and someone came and tried to take credit for something that you produced. That would not be good. And depending on where you are and how much of a champion a person is against plagiarism, you could actually get kicked out of school. You could probably get disbarred if you were a, law, a person in law. I mean, there's so many things that could happen to you for stealing. All you have to do is paraphrase it or put quotation marks around it. That's how you address that. But copying someone else's work is not okay. This is something that I have to say over and over and over again. If you're a STEM person, maybe you end up doing research, you might publish. The editors will not take your paper if they find that you have plagiarized. And they might put you on a list and share it with other people. <laughs> so you don't want that to happen to you. I don't know if that actually happens. I'm just making that part up. Um, but you want to avoid plagiarism. There are so many resources out here to help you figure out what it is you're supposed to be doing, the steps and processes for publishing and so forth and so on. But this is a great uh, tool, so I thought I would share it with you. Um, I can leave this PowerPoint uh, so people can have access to at least the resources in it. Okay. All right, so I did not really truly understand this first bullet that I have until graduate school. And it wasn't even at the beginning of graduate school that this dawned on me. Because when I started graduate school, we were organizing for the Million Women March in Philadelphia. And I'm going to blame my mother-in-law for this. She said, one of her colleagues said, you can go and participate and organize for this event. We took like three buses of students from Florida a and to Philadelphia for this Million Women March. Now, I'm a graduate school, school student. I'm not, I don't have time to be doing that, but I found time to do it. So since I found time to do that, I was not doing my work. And so that kind of put me off a little bit in terms of my time frame. Later, my advisor told me he was very, very upset with me. And I'm like, for what? He said, because you were supposed to be in the lab, not out in the streets organizing. You could do that later when you have a credential, and it will mean more. And I was like, yes, sir. I said, why didn't you say anything? He said, because I'm learning just like you're learning how to manage graduate students. So, But eventually, if I wanted to get out of graduate school, I had to submit to the process. I had to embrace the work. Like I said earlier, there are no shortcuts. If you say you want to get a degree, then you have to do the work to get the degree. So and the sooner you decide to embrace and submit, embrace the experience, submit to the experience, 
the more you will get out of it, the more the world will open up to you, the, the more joy you'll find. A lot of the work is frustrating, but it's something that you said you wanted to do. So just do it. Get to know your instructors. This is mostly for the undergraduate students. Get to know your instructors. We are human beings. And if we know that you care, that makes us care even more. If, we know, if, we, if you seem not to care, we just chalk it up to youth. It's frustrating. We will work with you. If you have a really good attitude, <laughs> we'll try to work with you. But getting to know your instructors and also seeking out instructors or graduate students or upperclassmen as mentors will enhance your experience. Go to class. Every week I have somebody's grandmother died. Grandma died like six times. <laughs> that's, oh, that's my step-grandmother on my mother's boyfriend's side, cousin's side. Stop killing grandma. <laughs> uh, go to tutoring. If you know you're not, if you know you don't understand what the teacher said, you could ask the teacher if you go to office hours. You could ask another classmate that is doing well in the class. Or you could go to the tutor. You can also form study groups. Like I said earlier, when I was given that class in graduate school, and they said, you have to teach this information, I was like, oh shoot, I have to go and study really what is photosynthesis, and what are all of the steps to photosynthesis, so what's all involved. Um, when I was in uh, undergrad, though, we had to take organic. Organic was my Achilles heel. Mm -hmm. I had to do that twice. Um, but the second time around, we did study groups, and we had everybody in there. We had the person who knew what they were talking about, the people in between, and the, and the leech. <laughs> and we weren't upset about the leech being there, because the leech was the person that we needed to teach. So we focused on them. But it was great. We used to stay up uh, late, because we're, cause we're not at home, and we go to bed when we want to. We can stay out as late as we want to. This was after freshman year, we don't have a curfew. Um, we were in the engineering school. That's the building that stayed open, so we could go there, and we would bring our snacks. And I really liked the feeling of the study group. I enjoyed it. <laughs> Complete all of your assignments. Uh, you, have, you have to get a grade, and the grade is based on your performance through assignments. So um, if you don't do your assignments, then you're going to have a bad grade. So it's really that simple. And study for your exams. A lot of people think they could cram. But again, remember, I told you that when you graduate, if you don't know the fundamental information, you're going to have to go get it before you can succeed in the next level. So you might as well go ahead and get it right now instead of waiting until later. All right, some other things you want to do is get involved in undergraduate research. I am so promoting that. Do undergraduate research. Research finds that, says that students who are involved in undergraduate research tend to do, perform better in their classes. They tend to feel a sense of connectedness to their institution. You get to travel. Anybody ever gone to a student conference? <coughs> OK, it's fun. You hook up with people you've never seen before. I don't mean hook up in the sense that y'all mean hook up. You know what I mean? You see people. Some of y'all might do that too, but you see people, you meet people from around uh, the states who are doing things like what you're doing. It's fun. Undergraduate research is great. Um, do summer internships. No one should be going home in the summer to work at McDonald's or Wendy's or Target. If you are a STEM student, there are so many summer research opportunities that pay. I went every summer, except for the one summer I went to, to, uh, to summer school, I did a summer internship. I planned it very well. Sometimes you have to pay for your travel and your lodging. So I would pick the ones that were at home. I got to stay at home for free. And my parents bought groceries, so I didn't have to feed myself. So I was able to take all of my money from my summer internship with me back to school. So there are so many opportunities that are, are available. Mr. Uh, Lyons, I keep getting, I, I have email from Virginia State. I keep getting all these emails about these super duper career fairs. Please get your CV, your resume, and your nice ca business casual attire together and carry yourself over to the career fair. 
the companies are coming here the graduate schools are coming here you didn't even have to go anywhere all you had to do is put your shoes on and walk over to the table and present your best self so that you can benefit from the opportunities that they've presented to you that's so easy you don't have to get on the internet and look for it you don't have to call anybody all you have to do is walk right over to the to this really nice career fair and talk to the people they have money for you they have money for people who show that they care their stats even if you don't have the stats the way that you present yourself the fact that you could talk about something that you're interested in that you could potentially build upon at their institution be it an employer or a graduate program or a professional school they want to hear that and they're ready to give you the money I actually um, um, Dr. Conway mentioned that I have a scholarship that I, I have to get 10 students. I got two students last semester, or this semester. I need to fill seven more slots. I have money. I'm trying to give it away. I'm like, please take this money. It is so difficult, and I never imagined that this would be the case. If you are going to uh, professional school, please do Kaplan, Princeton Review, whatever, whatever um, preparatory um, program you could do. Don't go into taking a test code. It costs so much money, and I don't know if you can afford to keep paying $350 to take a test. But you need to prepare. And I think that you guys may have those resources on your campus. And if you don't, you need to ask someone, and they will make it happen for you. But don't go into those tests cold. Make sure you turn your applications in on time. All of this turn things in on time and make sure your application is complete prepares you for the future. When we apply for grants, if we're missing one sheet or if we didn't sign in, one, in a particular way or if we didn't have something that the application required, they put your stuff over here before it goes into the trash. <laughs> they don't even look at it. How many faculty members have ever sat on a review panel for grants? Am I telling a lie? Okay, so following instructions is not just to pick on you. I told my students, submit the assignment on Genzibar. That's like your Blackboard for our school. The girl emails me and I said, I'm not taking any more assignments in my email. I know you said don't send any e assignments to your email, but the system closed at 11.55, or no, before 11.55. First of all, I signed this assignment Thursday. So the fact that you waited until right before the system was going to close to submit it, that's your problem. That's not my problem. That happens too. You don't submit your grant on time. Your grant is not submitted. That's it. Apply next time. Thank you. OK? All right, so there's a lot of playing going on. I be around. I'm watching people. I see people. I see people in this room that I've seen at the social events at the sports events that's wonderful you need to take full advantage and immerse yourself in the full college experience don't just sit in your room don't just study 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 all the time you have to get involved in student organizations become a member of a sorority or fraternity but not at this if your GPA is already below a 2.5 that I don't even think they would consider you for some some organizations but if you have a C average you probably want to wait until you can increase that because you have to have a little cushion because I understand you might suffer just a little bit in terms of time management if you're trying to become a member of one of these organizations so consider all of that join SGA a lot of students around here be complaining. I hear it all the time. I don't like such and such, such as, you know, I don't, they didn't do what they said they were gonna do. Well, you didn't run for SGA. What are you going to do about it? And that translates over into your civic duty as a citizen later on in life. We, we complain about what our politicians do. What are you going to do about it? Hold the politicians' feet to the fire or run, and then you do it. So all of this is for practice. Uh, become a student ambassador. That's something I always wanted to do because they had these really cool maroon jackets at Tuskegee and they got to take all of the tour groups around and stuff. I just was so fascinated by that. But they wouldn't let me do it because I had a nose ring. Or at least I thought that's what was going to happen. I probably didn't apply. So I kind of like stood in my own way. <laughs> Don't get in your own head. Ask questions. 
and let the other person who's going to make the decision tell you no. And then regroup, figure out how you can get what you want in a different ethical, legal way. Okay. <laughs> If you can, if I had to do all over again, I probably would have applied to do um, study abroad. I tried to get my sister and my children to do it. They didn't want to do it. But if I had to do all over again, I would. And I probably will do uh, I can, it was a sabbatical, but you go over and you work at another institution. And I probably will incorporate that into my, to my work life soon. All right, now, this is, I'm going to wrap it up soon. When you all graduate, or before you graduate, you could join the Pre-Alumni Association. This is where I am marketing for uh, Virginia State University alums and the give back. You don't like how something is going on now. The institution needs money, so be prepared to donate your dollars towards that issue. I didn't like it when I was there. I'm going to make it my duty to contribute to that because we don't get our allotment for our institutions are always a third of larger institutions, just in case you didn't know that. It's not a lot of money. So we really do make miracles happen with our money. I know everybody thinks somebody got all the money. Where are they? Who has it? I don't know. <laughs> okay. So if you join pre-alumni, that gets you prepared for life as an alum. There, Virginia State has really shown me what it means to be an alum. Yeah, this school has the best alumni association I have ever seen in my life. And when you become a part of it, you'll see what I'm talking about. But they are everywhere and doing big and great things. We were all the way in San Antonio. This woman is on a boat. We're walking down the street. I think she must have had something that said Virginia State on. So my husband saw her, and I was like, that, that woman is not from Virginia State. They're not everywhere. Do you know we were walking later, that woman walked up on us, oh, that's my president. She just started doing all that. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, are you serious? Trojans really are everywhere. We were very far away from here. Um, so be prepared to give back. So if you want to give back and it not be a stressor for you, that means you're going to have to be high performing and get a high salary or make a high salary as an entrepreneur so you can give back. Uh, any little bit helps. Um, so after you graduate, you're either going to join the workforce or you're going to, nobody should be going home and not having anything to do right after school. You have time to prepare for that. So when you graduate, you can be like, well, where are you going next? Oh, I'll be starting my job at blah, 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 blah. Or I will be starting my graduate program this fall, blah, blah, blah. That's what you want to say when you graduate. Or you might want to be an entrepreneur and start a business, and that would be wonderful also. All right, so what types of jobs are there available? Uh, as of May 2015, I think this is, or this is the Bureau of Labor Statistics, there are a lot of people who are getting degrees in computer occupations that are going to have lots of opportunities. Uh, where is my area? Life sciences up there, uh, just under the eight million, but that's a little sliver. We need to improve that one. A lot of students say, hey, I don't have professors that look like me, or hey, I can't understand my professor. Those people deserve to have jobs too, but why don't you consider a career in higher education as a professor? And that will make the life sciences uh, sliver wider, okay? Who else? Engineers. Engineers will have lots of opportunities too. I think in those areas where you have those smaller um, bands means that you're going to have to really be on top of your game because it's going to be very competitive. If there are limited opportunities, then they are only going to want to work with the best. And so if you are just marginal in your profession, then you probably if you're not going to put your best foot forward, you need to really find out what your passion is so that you can, <laughs> you'll be able to have a job or be able to start some type of uh, job that's going to, you know, you'll be able to sustain yourself. All right, so who is going to, who is projected between 2014 and 2024? People who are in math, science occupations. I said to, there's going to be a 30% or a little less than 30% increase in opportunities. I think this one is from the uh, 
labor, the Bureau of Labor Statistics as well. And it looks like drafters, technicians, and mapping technicians, it's probably going to be a drop. That probably has something to do with technology and software. Now, if you're a cartographer or something like that, or just being a technician, period, may not necessarily translate into a high paying job. So, um, life sciences, we don't have an increase, like a 5% increase. But it looks like the people in the math areas are going to have more opportunities than most other areas, just for your information. So, you can visit these places. Uh, these resources to see where you stand in your perspective field too. Okay. I think I have one more and I think this is the end of my talk. Uh, look at that, solar photovoltaic installers. That's technically a technician's job, but I'm all for solar so I wanted to highlight that one. Um, you know, some people's lives are not centered around making a whole lot of money. Some people want to do work that's going to have an impact on society. If you are an installer of a solar panel, you are having an impact on society. And that might be enough for you, and that's fine. Uh, nurse practitioners, I think nurses are awesome because they do everything. And you can make up to $103,000 being a nurse. So. These are just some of the careers uh, that you can also research uh, on your own to see you know, what you could potentially uh, make in your field, if that is what your passion is. But I want to say this to you. As people of color, the majority of the room are people of color. We have so many issues in society. Again, I want to encourage you all to do your very best to increase diversity so that our issues can be addressed. Um, and that is really why you're in school. You're not in school so that you can have a high pay paying salary so that you can buy that Jaguar that I want uh, or buy that big house. That's not why you're in school. We need people with your skill set and your knowledge to actually apply that to society to make life better, to improve the quality of life for all people. And it just so happens that people of color tend to have way more issues, lack of access, and disenfranchisement experiences than most other people. So pick an issue. Pick an issue and apply what you are learning to that issue to address it and make life better for everyone. And on that note, I will say thank you all very much for your attention. And everybody have a fantastic day.